welcome everybody to open cv weekly webinar and today with we have with us uh, professor matteo poggi from the university of bologna representing team icam which is one of the teams that got selected in open cv spatial ai competition sponsored by intel and we are so excited to have you uh, professor uh, matteo here for explaining what you're doing in this competition but also and for illuminating uh, the audience about uh, this new technology called nerf which has taken the computer vision and ai world by storm so welcome yeah yeah basically uh, i do my research at the university of bologna and uh, i deal with computer vision and uh, deep learning and most of my works uh, concerns depth estimation in particular using uh, stereo for instance and uh, yeah, in the most recent month, uh, I'm giving a look uh, together with uh, the ICANN boys uh, to these Nerf technologies. So we choose uh, this uh, uh, contest also to play a bit with these technologies and try to bring them, uh, let's say, to the real world. Okay. So before we start the presentation, I just want to uh, also introduce uh, Phil Nelson, who is the content manager at opencv.org. Uh, welcome, Phil. Yeah, good morning, everybody. This is a especially exciting episode for me. As uh, some people know, my first job in the computer vision industry was with Occipital, who made a 3D scanning device um, based on the the old uh, Connect tech, essentially. And so this is a totally different, you know, style with uh, really exciting results. Um, <clears throat> if this is your first time joining us, or if you just need a reminder, there's a couple of things we do every week here on OpenCV Weekly Webinar, one of which is a special giveaway to one lucky winner in the Zoom audience. Later in that webinar, I will ask a question based on uh, the slides from the webinar, and the first person to answer that will win $200 worth of Azure credits from our sponsors at Microsoft Azure on super fast Intel hardware. Also, we'll be taking Q&A from you in the audience, so please use the little button on the Zoom uh, bar there to ask your question at any point during the webinar, and we'll try to flow it into the conversation, as well as reserve some time at the end for questions we just couldn't get to during the regular presentation. And one little error on my side, I want to, uh, uh, I want to thank our sponsors, Intel and Microsoft Azure for this competition. In fact, we are running a multiple of these things uh, with Intel and Microsoft. And so there's a little bit of confusion sometimes, you know, I'm not sure which, <laughs> which one is being sponsored by which. Extremely sorry about that. Uh, this, is, uh, this competition is being sponsored by uh, Intel and Microsoft Azure. Yes, use that Oak Delight contest hashtag to see all the cool stuff that the teams are posting lately. Um, yeah, it's, it's been really great to see what people are putting out these days. All right, let's start the presentation. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Let me know if you can see it, okay. Okay, so uh, today's talk uh, is uh, entitled Scan Nerfer, bringing real object into metaverse. And basically uh, we will see uh, what we are developing for the, for the contest in particular, our scan nerf pipeline that is sketched in this first uh, uh, slide. So let's talk about uh, the metaverse, what we mean uh, with metaverse. Uh, basically, uh, since uh, we are hearing about this new concept uh, from uh, a couple of months, and with metaverse, we mean uh, a tight connection between the real world uh, we see every day and uh, virtual reality or any kind of augmented content we might want to project into our real world. So basically we can see uh, two main connections between the two worlds and we will uh, dig further into these uh, uh, connections uh, during this presentation. And on one side, we might want to uh, augment the content we see every day. So we, we might have some uh, virtual content uh, in the scene uh, we are navigating into, but we, can, we could also uh, want to do the opposite. We can bring uh, some real object into a virtual environment uh, where we could navigate, for instance, with this kind of uh, visual we have here. So to give One you thing taste. I would like to add about uh, Metaverse is that people may, because uh, Facebook took this initiative with the, uh, with the word Metaverse, 
people may think that it is uh, only restricted to one company, but the truth is that there will be many metaverses or whatever the plural uh, is. It is not just one uh, company thing, right? Every company could have its own metaverse. There could be some convergence also, but it is not just one company we are talking about. It is a much more general idea uh, than, uh, than what uh, Facebook is proposing. I mean, they would have their own metaverse, but there would be other companies that would come up with their own metaverse as well. Yeah, we could uh, we could say this uh, will be a, a way to combine the, the real universe with uh, uh, virtual reality in a, any way. And of course, yeah, probably different companies will have different plans for this. So yeah. And uh, just to give you an intuition about uh, one of the two direction we can follow to bring some content from one uh, universe to the other. So from the real world to the virtual world or vice versa. Here we can see uh, an augmented reality application. So in this case, we are projecting this kind of uh, small robots in a scene we are framing with our smartphone. So basically, uh, this scene is uh, a scene from the real world. The robot itself is uh, a virtual object and we are projecting it into the real world. To do this, basically, we need to do this in a realistic way. We need to model the geometry of the real world so we can use it to project the virtual object in the real scene and basically make it interact with the scene in a realistic way. For instance, we want this robot to be hidden by this foreground object every time we move the camera uh, and uh, uh, we bring the object in between the camera and the robot. So to do this, we need to have a good modeling of the real world we are observing. Of course, we can also follow the opposite path. We would uh, like, we might uh, like to bring uh, a real object, for instance, this kind of uh, tennis ball from the real world into a virtual world in which we navigate, for instance, every time we wear an object like this. So in this specific case, we are projected into a virtual environment where we probably will navigate into castles, forests, and whatever fantastic environment we may imagine of. But maybe we would like to bring some uh, object from the real scene in which we are at the moment we are playing together with us into the virtual world. And to do this, of course, uh, the mechanism we have to follow is different because in this case, we want to model for uh, in a realistic way, of course, the geometry and the appearance of this object in order to bring it into the virtual environment and in order to make it uh, interact with the virtual world in a proper manner. Yeah. Oh, I also wanted to add one more thing about the previous uh, slide. Uh, when we talk about computer vision uh, in general, if you move to the previous slide, uh, yeah. where you're, so this, um, you know, uh, adding virtual objects to the real world, it's very, it's, an, it's a very old problem and we have solved that in many uh, specific instances. For example, when we show uh, the yellow line on a football field, you know, American football field, that yellow line is virtual and that has been around for more than, you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, similarly, having billboards, which are virtual uh, in a soccer field, for example, you have virtual billboards where advertisements are being shown. That's also pretty old technology, but to do, so, but there are very specific instances of this kind of technology. When you go to very general, like this one, this is a general thing that you want to put some arbitrary object in an arbitrary scene, the complexity explodes, right? This is thousand times more <laughs> difficult than uh, putting stuff on a billboard um, in, in a soccer field. So I just wanted to give that historical context that this is, the idea is not new. The idea, idea has been around for such a long time but the implementation was not possible because of uh, technical limitations until until re recently. It's also true that it seems as though uh, televised sports has pushed a lot of this innovation into the mainstream over the yeah. years, I think. Yeah. Sorry yeah. for the interruption. Yeah. No, 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 no problem. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Basically, this is a, a quite old fashioned problem. Yeah. 
while uh, probably uh, this opposite pathway is something uh, yeah more recent uh, and for some uh, degrees uh, uh, also more exciting yeah so yeah as i said we want to model the geometry and the appearance of this object uh, the the best way we can and uh, fortunately we have some uh, very brand new tools that can help us uh, in particular uh, since a couple of years we have this brand new technology that is called the uh, neural radiance field that allows uh, to uh, learn because uh, here we are uh, talking about uh, deep learning to learn uh, uh, the geometry and appearance of an object or uh, in a more complex uh, scenario of an entire scene by simply training a neural network on a very specific uh, object or scene in order to use this neural network itself once, once it is trained yep. to uh, build a geometric model of the object itself or to render images from the model itself. So basically, uh, this is uh, quite a different uh, paradigm compared to what we are used to know from deep learning, because usually we train a neural network and we want this neural network to generalize to any, uh, any possible uh, scenario we can encounter. In this case, the neural network is, uh, I would say, overfitted on a single object and a single scene in order to be able to reproduce this scene or object, for instance, from a different point of view. And uh, to do this, uh, this network uh, is uh, uh, very special because uh, uh, the input to this network uh, are the 3D points in space uh, we want to reproduce in our 3D model or in, our, uh, in, the, in the geometry of our scene. And the neural network is trained given the 3D coordinates uh, of uh, any 3D point in the, in the scene, it is trained to produce a density and a color for such a point in the 3D world that we can use either to build, for instance, a 3D model like the one we can see here, or to uh, run some kind of uh, rendering of the 3D model and to retrieve basically some uh, 2D images from, the, from a single point of view that we can select at any time after training. So like I said, this is uh, an approach that is quite new in computer vision because uh, basically most of the time we are used to uh, do uh, the, the opposite. Uh, we have images and we want to recover the geometry from the images. Here we want to build, uh, I would say, a compact representation of an entire scene. And we want to use this compact representation to observe the scene from any new uh, viewpoint we want to obtain even new images or images that we have already observed. So this so, kind of, yeah. Can, can I uh, just uh, add a little bit to what you just said so that we are, you know, I'm, I'm playing the role of our audience so that I, I'm, I'll keep summarizing what you just said because this is so important. Uh, and, and it's, by doing it's so, so much different too than like the, yeah. it's not necessarily obvious because it's so different than the like kind of standard way of doing like a 3D scan. This is much more of a it, capturing everything, including the scene that it's in as well. Go ahead, Satya. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the way I look at it is that think about this nerf, uh, this uh, new kind of neural network as a black box, right? Don't worry about anything else. It's a black box. And the input to this are various pictures of the scene. So you move the camera around, take several pictures of the scene. Uh, you just, you may, maybe you take a picture by moving the camera in a circle, but the idea is that you take uh, the picture from, let, let's say a dome or other places, as many pictures as possible of the scene. And you feed it, that's the input to uh, the neural network. You train the neural network and this black box uh, gets trained. Now, during the inference process, what you want is given any viewing direction, right? So you threw away all the input images. We are not interested in that. You only, the only thing you have right now is this trained neural network. The input to this trained neural network would be a viewing direction. You would say that, oh, I want to look at the scene from this viewing direction, and it would output an image uh, of the scene from that viewing direction, from that novel viewing direction. You may not have any 
uh, image from that particular viewing direction, looking into the scene. But this trained neural network is such that it will produce the image for you, uh, even though uh, you may or may not know the geometry uh, of the scene, right? Uh, is that a fair summary, Matteo? Uh, yeah, I, I would say this, this kind of resume everything. Yeah, we, we can see this uh, neural network as, uh, I would say, a digest of the scene, so. Right, okay, so it, it is representing the scene in these weights instead yeah, of yeah, yeah. Uh, instead of pixels right yeah okay yeah yeah thanks for uh, for assuming also because this is quite hard to explain in a few minutes so yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah basically uh, what we can see here in this video are uh, uh, what we might think uh, they are 3d objects uh, uh, rotated in space so here we can see this kind of chair rotating around. We, we might think we are rotating this chair around, but basically this is exactly the effect of what Satya said, because here we are simply rendering, so we are generating images from this kind of chair from different viewpoints in space. So basically we can uh, get an image of this object from uh, everywhere around the object itself. And to obtain this kind of effect, of course, we need several images that we want to collect from all around the object. The more images we have, the more precise and accurate the neural network we will train will be. So we collect these 100 images and we use them for training. Once we have trained our neural network, we don't need these images anymore. Uh, and we simply ask the neural network, uh, given a single point of view, to generate for us uh, the image we want. And uh, yeah, as I said, we need to collect uh, several images all around the objects. So the basic assumption is that uh, we take our camera and we move uh, around the object. Of course, uh, we can simulate the very same behavior if uh, uh, we do not move around the object, but if we move the object itself. So to obtain something like uh, what we have seen in this video. Quick, here quick we... note here. Um, I was joking with a friend of mine that we should have a drinking game on this show that every time we see a camera frustrum, I think that last slide would have killed both of us. <laughs> 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 yeah. And Talk about yourself, Phil. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> so yeah, basically what we observe in this video gives us an intuition about this. Here we don't really know if we are rotating the object itself or if we are moving the camera around the object. So what we want to do is to obtain this kind of effect. We want to collect all these hundreds of images of the object itself. Yet we want to optimize this acquisition process. So yeah, we can move the camera around to some degrees, but maybe we cannot reach any corner of the scene. And we can compensate for this missing information by simply rotating the object. In order to do this, we will see that we can implement an hardware platform for this. And uh, if we are able to collect uh, these hundred or even a thousand images uh, for a single object, we will see that uh, we can uh, obtain uh, a compact representation, a compact uh, model of this object that we can use to uh, render any kind of image we want. And so basically to have this object projected into a real world. Because once we are capable of uh, rendering this object from any possible viewpoint we want to um, frame it. Basically, this is what we can do once we are in the real world and once we want to render this kind of object for any kind of actions we want to play in the virtual world. So basically, once we have done this, we can simply uh, bring our object to the metaverse. So, to implement this kind of process, uh, we have uh, built uh, what, we what we call uh, a scan station. This kind of scan station basically uh, allows uh, to uh, collect images according to two different degrees of freedom, because we have this kind of uh, arm over which we can 
mount our camera to scan the object, and we can move the arm around to uh, modify the height, for instance, at which we collect the images. Of course, uh, uh, moving the arm this way somehow limits the uh, amount of viewpoints we can collect for the object itself. However, if we design uh, uh, this kind of table over which uh, uh, we can put the objects during scanning, and if we design this uh, table to uh, be capable of rotating, we can simply collect uh, um, images all around uh, the object in uh, 360 uh, degrees, for instance. And thus, uh, combining this kind of rotation of the table together with the rotation of the arm itself, we can really acquire thousands of images from a uh, very different uh, point of view of the object and thus obtain a higher density of images that we will see can allow us to train the network at the best. Once the network is trained, of course, we will be able to reproduce the object we have scanned from any different viewpoint and obtain, of course, our, our virtual twin of the object. So this is uh, simply a concept of the scan station itself. Let's have a look at the very first implementation we built of our, of our station. Here we can see on the left the basis of the, the arm we are rotating around the scan station. We will have a larger picture of this in the next slides. And we can see that during the acquisition, the camera moves from top of the scene down to the basis while the table itself rotates, allowing us to uh, collect images from any viewpoint of uh, these Lego blocks we have uh, on the rotating table. And importantly, it's also every viewpoint will have different reflections and, and stuff yeah. like that, which yeah. matters a lot here. Yeah, yeah, we will see this, uh, this point about reflection is one of the main challenges uh, in this kind of process. Finally, before going to the next slide, we can see we have uh, a chessboard on the rotating table, and uh, we will see in a while that this chessboard is required to recover the information about the viewpoint of the object itself, and we will use this information during training. Because, of course, once we train the network, we also need to tell the neural network every time uh, we give an image to the network itself, we need to tell which is the viewpoint that is used to acquire the images in order to allow the network to, of course, learn the entire geometry of the scene. So this is, uh, let's say, a picture in large of the scanner uh, station that we are building for the challenge. Basically, we have the arm over which we, mount, we mount our OCD um, light camera that we use to collect any image of the object we want to scan. Here we have our table over which we can put the chessboard that we use to estimate the viewpoint, as well as the object we want to scan just on top of the chessboard. And finally, we use three motors uh, a couple of them is used to basically rotate the main arm of the scan station. And the third one is used to implement the rotating table, allowing to get uh, different viewpoints of the same object while rotating. So basically the entire scan station, as we have seen in the previous video, and as we will see in the next videos, because I will show you a couple of uh, uh, examples uh, uh, of acquisition of objects. Basically, the arms uh, fixes his uh, height over the scene. We rotated the table uh, a couple of times in order to uh, be able to collect uh, multiple uh, images of the same viewpoint. Then, once we have rotated the table a couple of times, we tilt the, the arm in order to uh, move it toward the basis of the scan station. Once we have moved the arm, we repeat the rotation of the table. So we collect another set of images. Then we move the arm again until we get to the basis of the station. With this process, we will see 
we can collect about, uh, um, I will tell, more than 5,000 frames that we can use, of course, to uh, train the network itself and uh, basically to model our object and to bring it to the virtual reality. So in this slide, uh, I just show an intuition about the different viewpoints uh, uh, where the camera collects the, the images during the scanning process. So we can see here on top, we have the very first uh, round, the very first cycle of acquisition from the very top view of the scene. Then we have this uh, uh, inner cycle that corresponds to the first movement of the arm. So we first move the arm and then we rotate the table a couple of times. Then we move again, again, and again until we reach the lower bound of the scanning station. And as I said, this results in more than 5,000 images. Of course, we could uh, uh, even augment uh, this uh, amount of images by simply uh, moving the arm with uh, smaller steps between one cycle and another. So here I show you a couple of pictures of what uh, the OCD light camera sees at the very beginning of the acquisition process. So here we have the color image acquired by the center camera. And uh, here we also have uh, the grayscale images we can collect uh, with uh, the left and right side cameras. Everything we do uh, in terms of uh, uh, data collection and uh, um, neural network training is done on the color image because we want to learn, we want to effectively learn a color representation of the object itself while we can use and we will use in the following steps in the challenge we can use the stereo pair itself to get some depth information about the scene and to do some further post processing because knowing in advance the geometry of the scene can help both the neural network during training or can help us to segment the object itself for the scene because we will see in a while that uh, we need uh, to uh, take into account that uh, we are not only moving the object itself, but we are also moving the table and the background with respect to the movement we do with the camera. Because uh, one of the basic assumptions of uh, what we do when we train a neural radiance field is that uh, we observe a static scene and we move the camera around. In the pipeline we have sketched so far, okay, we are moving the camera, but uh, to compensate for some missing viewpoints about the object, we are also moving the scene. So we are violating the basic assumption behind neural radiance fields. So if uh, there's any question or... Oh, I, can, I can do one actually. So we, we talked a bit about the, the reflections. Um, uh, Par Ando would like to know, can, uh, as a result of this, can you render the new images with different lighting conditions? Well, you can if you uh, somehow model this kind of different uh, uh, illumination source. Uh, in our project, actually, we are not focusing on uh, relighting or modeling this kind of illumination. So to reduce the uh, reflection, uh, uh, to be the minimum, we basically collect uh, all the images in a white room. And uh, for now, we are experimenting with objects with minimal reflections. But of course, this is something that should be taken into account, in particular because if we move the object itself, we will basically see different reflections on the object. And so, again, uh, we are somehow violating the basic assumption that the world is static and the camera is moving. So for now, we are limiting the reflection uh, at the most. But yeah, this yeah. is something that should be modeled. Yeah. Yeah, and I, th I think in terms of um, you know making things feel much more real when you bring them into these virtual spaces, the reflections are a huge part of that. Um, it's it's is as important as uh, you know attenuation for audio or, or reverb where nobody really sounds like they're near you or far away from you unless you've really accurately modeled those because our, our minds, our, our brains are so tuned to the way our ears hear stuff and, and the way our eyes th see things in real life that 
um, when you when you bring stuff in, into the virtual spaces and you know maybe they don't cast realistic shadows or maybe the reflections are all off based on the scene it it's uh, it really takes you out of it it's much less real feeling I think uh, yeah, for yeah people interested in uh, relighting etc uh, they can look at this paper called uh, block Nerf, I think uh, where street view images were used and they are taken with different uh, at different times of the day etc and so you know they are able to generate um, not only what the scene looks like from different views but also different times of the day yes uh, uh, Niraj uh, posted that in the chat about 10 minutes ago way ahead okay. of us thanks Niraj <laughs> okay okay so once uh, our pipeline uh, has been sketched. We started uh, scanning different objects and uh, uh, basically bringing them to the metaverse. So here I'm showing you an example of uh, an apple we are scanning. And I will catch your attention on a few details. For instance, once we move the arm, we can observe some uh, uh, vibration of the camera. So we will need to deal with this, and we will see in a couple of minutes uh, how to deal with this. And again, uh, yeah, I would like to point out the attention of uh, on um, on the chessboard because the chessboard uh, is necessary to estimate uh, the viewpoints uh, at which we are collecting the images. And uh, this kind of chessboard is not a standard chessboard; is a Cherokee uh, chessboard that has some uh, peculiarities and uh, without going uh, too much in details, uh, the good uh, point about this uh, pattern is that is uh, uh, very robust to occlusions. And uh, as you can see here, we have uh, plenty of occlusions. So uh, if we use a standard chessboard, uh, probably many times uh, we would not be able to estimate the viewpoints uh, while uh, with this kind of pattern, we can always estimate the correct viewpoint and then we can estimate it for any of the 5,000 images we are collecting. So as you can notice, the object itself from start to the end changes its appearance a lot because basically we are collecting it from very uh, from many and many viewpoints. And this allows us to obtain as a final result, this kind of model. So basically here we are observing uh, in an interactive way uh, the apple we have scanned so far. And to do this, uh, we in this specific case, we are using a neural radiance field. In particular, I would say a uh, very recent and advanced uh, um, evolution of the neural radiance field that is called uh, uh, instant uh, uh, neural graphic primitives that basically uh, makes the entire process faster. And as we can see, we can interact with the object, we can rotate it, we can inspect the object itself from any viewpoint, and the final effect is very realistic. So a few more details about what we do during the scanning process. As I said from the video, we can easily notice that the camera itself vibrates a lot once we move the arm but uh, we can easily find uh, this behavior from uh, the Chiruko, uh chessboard itself, because uh, when we estimate uh, the viewpoint for this kind of acquisitions, we can see that uh, the uh, z-axis, uh, uh, of course, uh, changes a lot uh, during the acquisition because the camera itself is moving a lot. Mm -hmm. So we can find these, uh, I would say, orange patterns, and we can simply filter out any image collected during, the, during this kind of fluctuations. Mm -hmm. This way, we can ensure that we are taking uh, uh, images that uh, are not blurred because uh, of the camera motion. And so we can use them at the best to train our neural radiance field. Finally, uh, another important uh, detail about our scanning station. Uh, as we have seen so far, uh, we are moving both the camera and the object uh, all around. So we are violating the basic assumption behind the neural radiance field. But uh, we can uh, overcome this problem if we only focus on the object itself, because the main component in the scene that is violating the assumption is the background that is moving together with the camera itself, 
but it's also moving with the object when we rotate the table. So we simply need to get uh, uh, to get rid of the background. And to do this, we can simply compute some kind of uh, mask to be applied to the scene itself. For this specific uh, case, and uh, in most cases, we can simply look uh, at the color uh, in the image because uh, we can see here the apple itself is the only uh, colored object inside the chessboard. So we can simply look, for instance, at the variance of the color of the color channels that will be very low, where the pattern is is uh, black and white, and will be much higher for the object itself. Of course, this is good if we are scanning a colored object. If we are scanning a black and white object, this won't work. But we can reason about uh, some priors. For instance, uh, we know the chessboard uh, is a plane, and uh, we can use the OCD light uh, camera also to have uh, some uh, depth estimation of the apple itself. And we can basically segment the object into the 3D space and remove everything else that is not part of the main object. So just to give you a quick example about the segmentation process, here is another scene that we are scanning. Here we are scanning this toy. This is the mask we can obtain through color um, analysis and depth analysis. And this is the final image we obtain if we mask everything around the object with an alpha channel. So we can obtain uh, thousands of images of uh, this single object. And then we can start training our neural network, in particular, in this case, our instant uh, neural network. And we can see that uh, after a few seconds, our object has been rendered, and we can interactively render the object itself from different viewpoints. So basically, we have modeled the object itself in 3D space, and we are ready to bring this into any kind of virtual reality application we can imagine. I have another example here. I'm showing the rendering process slightly slowly. This, uh, this toy is uh, yeah, a different toy. Here we have taken a taxi car. And we can see that after a few seconds, during which the neural network learns how to model the object, after these very few seconds, then we can interact with the 3D space and we can render images from any viewpoint of the single object. That's so amazing. Four, four or five seconds of training? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, just a matter of seconds, yeah. Also, wow. of course, uh, the resolution of the image itself uh, has an impact on this. Yeah. But uh, yeah, with uh, the OCD, uh, camera, just using, uh, yeah, I would say 1K images, uh, we can train the network in seconds. This Is because... the training also happening on the uh, Oak Delight? No, not no. yet. <laughs> not yet. Yeah, that would be <laughs> quite... Yeah, that would be, that would be, I would say, astonishing. Yeah. No, yeah. no, here, uh, of course, we need a GPU, so... Okay. And, uh, of course, uh, the training is also... For now, anyway. Uh, yeah, for now. <laughs> and of course, the training is uh, uh, that fast because we have thousands of images. We have thousands of images. If uh, we would have, uh, I would say, uh, just uh, yeah, 10 images or maximum 100 images, the process itself would be slightly slower. And probably we, won't, we will not be able to render the object from any viewpoint. But the good point is that uh, the scanning station allows uh, in, uh, I would say, 10 minutes to get uh, all these thousand, thousand images and then uh, to train uh, in a matter of seconds this kind of uh, representation that basically is what is uh, all, all we need to bring the object into the virtual world. Mm. Wow. So just to sum up i'm showing you a couple of pictures about objects we are scanning just uh, in these uh, couple of days we have taken yeah a lot of toys because they are easy to place uh, on the scanning station and uh, here i'm showing you a couple of uh, screenshots both from the viewpoint of the OCD camera so here 
this is what uh, on top this is what the the camera is uh, acquiring from the scene while on the bottom row we have an external camera that has been synchronized with the OCD camera just to show to the audience and to ourselves uh, what we are doing with the scanning station. So we start uh, from the very top and then we move the arm. Of course, uh, between one movement and the another, we are rotating the table. And in the end, we reach the very bottom of the scanning station. So that's all about uh, what we are doing for the challenge. And uh, basically this is uh, the standpoint uh, at which we are now. And uh, yeah, before concluding the talk, I would like to thank all the attendees, but also all the guys that are behind this project that are Daniele, that is the CEO of uh, ICANN, but also the other, all the other guys that are working uh, together with us, uh, both in terms uh, of uh, theory and also in terms of practice. We have a lot of discussions about uh, how to use this neural radiance field uh, to get some uh, real application and possibly something uh, that we can use off the shelf uh, in a new environment. So thanks to Luca, Federico, Damiano, Marco, and Nicola. That's great. That's a great presentation. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah thanks. We can, that was, that was uh, great. We can, uh, because we, uh, just in time, we have a uh, very good on time. Uh, we have time for uh, a lot of questions. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, well, let's go ahead and do our, our trivia giveaway first. So um, today, uh, go ahead and unshare your screen, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, that, that was great. Um, thanks for. Thanks for that uh, excellent presentation. So uh, it's time for our giveaway. We'll be giving away $200 worth of uh, credits to Microsoft Azure on blazing fast Intel hardware, thanks to our sponsors of OpenCV Spatial AI Contest. What's gonna happen is you in the Zoom chat are going to answer the question I ask in the Zoom chat. The first person to answer it correctly will win $200 of Azure credits. During the presentation, we noticed that there's a uh, specific kind of chessboard that they use when they're scanning these objects. What is that style of chessboard called? Uh, there we go. All right, looks like uh, Silverio got the first answer. Got the answer correctly first. It is uh, Charuco. It's a combination of chessboards and Aruco markers. So congratulations, uh, Silverio. Uh, Sil Sil Silver yeah, Silverio. Um, please send an email to phil at opencv.org and we'll make sure that you get your Azure credits. That's great. And just, uh, you know, we, we tell people about resources also. Uh, if you can actually print these things uh, at your own home, print it correctly and use uh, for a for, for your own applications, uh, for you know calibration applications, and OpenCV has all the right tools for uh, helping you calibrate your cameras using uh, Charuco markers as well. But if you want to look, if you're looking for something industrial, uh, you could go and check out Calib.io. They have these patterns on very uh, you know nicely printed board, etc. And they are not a sponsor or anything. I just thought that uh, it's a good resource people should know about. Uh, maybe next time we should get them as sponsors. <laughs> yeah, but, and they're, uh, they're, they're boards like, you know, thick enough because one of the most, one of the important things here is that it has to be very flat, yes. um, you know, it, it, that it materially affects the quality of the calibration hugely if it's not super flat. And so, yeah. so yeah. yeah, for people who are looking for that kind of calibration, industrial grade calibration, they should look at calib.io. Definitely. So yeah, let's uh, get to some questions. Some really good questions here. Um, your, your presentation sparked a lot of people's imaginations. Um, Bob and Dan would like to know, how did you scan the bottom of the apple? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, actually, when we have seen the video about the apple, there was some kind of illusion because uh, actually the apple had an hole at the bottom. We didn't figure out because we could see I would say the inner part of the apple that is of the same color of the apple itself. And so we were tricked about this, but of course, right now the apple itself uh, does not have the button. So okay. this is something we are looking into because we had a couple of ideas about uh, how to fill the object uh, uh, all around. But uh, yeah, right now we cannot see just uh, uh, from bottom from the bottom of the chessboard. Yeah. 
Yeah, in the past, I've seen people, you know, like hanging objects with like uh, fishing wire or like you know a very thin filament, so they can they can move the camera underneath as well. Um, I've yeah, also so seen it was just scanning, an optical illusion, is what you're saying. I have also seen uh, commercial scanning applications where they literally ask you to uh, invert the object. So they do one scan and then they ask you to invert the object um, and put it. And some way they were able to fix, um, you know, find the correspondences, et cetera. Um, so that's that's another option, not trivial. It's actually very tricky to do that. But I, I'm pretty certain I have seen this, uh, you know, even 10 years back. Uh, my memory is a little bit shaky, but I'm almost certain that I have seen this. Yeah, I, I, uh, somebody also suggested, what about uh, a glass, a glass board? That's <laughs> not, yeah, not, not yeah. the we, worst we, idea, but we were thinking as about something about this. Uh, if we could uh, just uh, get the viewpoints uh, without using the chessboard, uh, we could uh, just use a glass. But uh, we need to take care about the glass because uh, probably the light passing through the glass could have some kind of uh, I would say effect on the final rendering. So I'm not sure. The, of course, this is something that we should study, but I'm not sure it should be so straightforward. Let's say. Yeah, definitely a, a you know an interesting problem. Um, the the results, I mean, are, are really cool. I I love the. Uh, I really I really liked seeing the uh, external image of the of the rig there because I was wondering myself like how are they how are they actually tilting it like that with the <laughs> without it like falling over. Um, I'm also imagining you know part of the spirit of this competition, uh, OpenCV Spatial AI contest is we, we're prototyping things with Legos that we could then scale up you know to industrial size and I'm imagining how cool it would look with that this giant you know rig maybe made of like wood or metal that you could scan like a person sized or like an actual like a full sized car with It'd be pretty pretty cool <laughs> um let's see more questions here so uh local would like to know is we be making the source code available for this project uh yeah actually uh, I can't tell about this because, uh, yeah, Daniele should be the right person about uh, for this question. So, yeah. All right. So, we'll, we'll uh, follow just, up I don't, I don't know. Leader. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you are representing the university, and Daniela is uh, the CEO of ICANN. And they, uh, you know, uh, technically, ICANN is the, uh, is, is, the team I can is the com competitor in this one, and it's a collaboration between university and industry. And uh, you know they will. Uh, it would be great if they do it, but it's not a requirement of the competition. He says uh, in the chat, next year we'll scan a real dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, uh, Richard would like to know: Are there limitations regarding the input image resolution? Uh, okay, yeah, uh, that's a good question because um, for some kind of uh, newer radiance fields frameworks, this represents a limitation because, uh, of course, uh, the higher the resolution, the higher the memory requirements during training. And uh, before using this kind of uh, instant uh, rendering tool, uh, we tried a couple of a couple more, and some of them had some kind of limitation in terms of memory. Basically, just uh, using for training uh, something like 1,000 1, images at uh, 1K resolution uh, was just uh, too much uh, for some tools. For this kind of instant tool, this is not a problem. I guess we can scale up to this kind of 5,000 images. Maybe um, getting to higher and higher amount of images and, of course, resolution uh, at some point could be an issue. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, uh, Richard would like to know, can this handle objects with transparent or semi-transparent surfaces? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, right now I would say no, because uh, uh, now, I would say the, um, uh, the vanilla neural radiance field uh, would have uh, many problems with transparent objects, in particular, 
I think there's a couple of uh, following up papers showing some results with transparent objects. And you could see that uh, the 3D models that the network learns uh, basically do not uh, have uh, the, uh, I would say the 3D surface uh, in correspondence of the transparent object. Maybe you can get some realistic uh, rendering because the network itself learns to propagate uh, the color through the space. But I would say you would have some problem in, in, in case of uh, uh, 3D modeling. And at some point, maybe you can get this issue out once you render from some specific viewpoints. So I would say this is an open problem. But uh, yeah, of course, this is a, a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And that's, you know, uh, historically, that's been one of the toughest problems with 3D capture of any kind is uh, the reflections, but also translucency uh, and fully transparent, like glasses, for example. I remember back in the occipital days, if, if you would, we did a 3D scan of somebody's head, it would just not, you know, lasers see through glass. <laughs> and so it would basically look like you were wearing a mask, like a, like a raccoon mask um, when you were wearing your glasses. Um, uh, Tim would like to know what file formats uh, can this can this be exported to like some some format to to directly bring into a metaverse project or like an Unreal Engine scene or Unity. Well, yeah, this is something we are uh, working on because uh, actually once we have this kind of representation, we can uh, simply extract the object itself from the neural network and we can render either a mesh uh, either a point cloud, whatever you want. So right now we are still uh, studying which could be the best option to bring uh, everything there. Also another maybe very challenging uh, opportunity could be to have uh, the several aspects of the environment encoded by single specific neural networks. So have a, a further different representation that could interact one with the other. Of course, maybe this is looking uh, a little uh, far uh, into the horizon, but uh, I, I believe at some point we will get something like this. Yeah. Is it, a, I have a follow-up question. Uh, do you know of any initiative with, you know, Unity or Unreal Engine where they, are trying to render nerfs directly without having to export uh, because you know you can imagine that some of the nerfs would not capture the 3D geometry appropriately, but still render it just fine. You know the rendering may just look fine. Uh, is there any uh, work going on in that area? Is are people doing it? Actually, um, I'm not aware of any, but okay. uh, I think at some point they will consider this because uh, the potential of this kind of uh, instant neural radiance field uh, is uh, huge. So, yeah. yeah, and as as more and more devices have onboard dedicated AI processors that are even separate from the GPUs, like on modern Apple hardware and and you know certain certain other systems. I think it becomes more feasible to do that in, you know, really high resolution virtual spaces as well. Like right now, it might be a little too computationally expensive um, to to be uh, rendering the nerfs in the current state while there's all this other stuff going on with, you know, different light sources and different people and being tracked and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, John would like to know what is the size of the trained rendering model? Uh, say, for example, with uh, the the Apple object okay yeah uh i would say this depends with the specific uh, uh neural radiance field implementation you use for instance the very vanilla implementation simply saves uh, the object itself uh, encoding into a neural network so the the size will be a few kilobytes while more modern approaches uh, uh pursuing uh, speed both in terms of training and rendering, also use uh, additional representations, such as, for instance, voxel grids and whatever. And this, most of the time, uh, comes at the cost of memory. So some of these uh, um, frameworks uh, saves up to, I would say, six to 700 megabytes of uh, data. So yeah, you get uh, the speed, uh, but you pay for the memory. So, right. 
Yeah, and that's uh, that's not a huge amount, but it's still for for uh, it would make it difficult to do it on board certain devices um, that that don't necessarily have that much available. Um, yeah, that yeah, makes I, sense. I, I would say it depends uh, with the application because uh, of course uh, maybe you cannot store one gigabytes of data, but we c you can store uh, maybe the images uh, at uh, a high enough resolution, and then you can instantly render the model from the images. So maybe this is something you can do. Maybe in some application you can, maybe in some others you cannot. Uh, so I think this kind of trade-off uh, is just uh, at the very beginning. And uh, we should study a lot uh, what we can get, uh, what we can gain uh, on one dimension if we pay on another one. Yeah. Yeah, those trade-offs are, you know, that's, that's how things get, you know, uh, specialized to, to be built in, you know, specific fields and specific uh, use cases is those figuring out what those trade-offs are. And so, yeah, definitely. It's, it's very exciting because, I mean, this, this method is really, how, how old, this is only a couple of months since this paper came out, isn't it? Uh, yeah, this one about uh, the instant uh, radiance field, uh, yeah, yeah, it's just a couple of months, yeah. Yeah, looking Maybe at the, yeah. yeah, it says January. It came out in yeah. January. So, <laughs> I mean, very, very state of the art. Um, uh, yeah, let's... Um, can, I, uh, go ahead. can I just plug in a few things uh, before, uh, you know, uh, people leave? Uh, I was just about to suggest that. <laughs> okay. Uh, our, uh, our Kickstarter campaign for deep learning with TensorFlow and Keras course is uh, running right now. And uh, we just added OGD Lite to the campaign. It is as an add-on, so you won't see it until you back the campaign. But we have allowed people to back the campaign with just $1 pledge to be able to get Oak Delight. And during this campaign, Oak Delight, uh, not during this entire campaign, but until we run out of uh, you know, supplies, uh, Oak Delight is being sold at $99 um, with the $1 pledge. So let's say $100. Uh, so you can go and check it out on our Kickstarter campaign. Uh, one thing I want uh, people to know very clearly that the uh, you know the shipping cost could be very uh, high, so you should look at our update where we give a shipping calculator, and also depending on the country where it is being shipped, there could be additional charges for um, customs duties etc. So this ninety nine dollars is just uh, the cost from our side. You need to add shipping um, cost and customs cost etc which can be pretty, uh, pretty big. Unfortunately, I missed uh, mentioning this point in my last uh, email that was sent out. Uh, apologies for that. I mean, we'll reiterate this point in our next email uh, new newsletter, but in our update, we have clearly mentioned this point. But Oak Delight still, even with all these things, and especially for people in the United States, it's a, it's a very good uh, deal because Oak Delight is uh, selling at $149 uh, just for this campaign. We have brought the price down to $99. And after we run out of the $99 thing, uh, it will be raised to 109. And finally it will settle down to 119. So check it out if you're interested in this. Um, I mean, uh, and also the campaign, if you're interested in deep learning uh, with TensorFlow and Keras, this is one of the, uh, you know, we are, we'll make it one of the best courses online. And uh, as part of this uh, backing this campaign, uh, you will also get a chance, uh, not a chance, you will get a copy of uh, Deep Learning with Python course, an, a B Deep Learning with Python book by Francois Cholet. So uh, yeah, check out. And it's a, it's a big old book. I mean, it's, uh, you, you, could, you could choke a horse with that thing. Yeah, right there. That's the book. So, um, and the second thing is that we are also going to do another uh, interesting competition. Uh, it's, uh, it's called uh, the AI show. Uh, the first pilot will be done uh, in about a month or so. And uh, for that, we, we will bring in some guests and we will ask them questions about AI, but not necessarily deeply technical questions, right? I mean, it will be somewhat technical, somewhat interesting. And if you have any questions uh, that you find interesting, some AI question, some obscure fact about AI um, that would be interesting to ask uh, in, the, in the competition, in the show, please send us, send us your suggestions. You can send us uh, your suggestions at newsletter at opencv.org. 
um, and we will will acknowledge. We already have a list of questions, and if your question is new and we use it, we will definitely acknowledge your contribution in the credits. Yes, uh, the Open CV AI game show is really exciting. You can sign up to be the first to learn more about it at OpenCV.org/gameshow, all one word. Um, yeah, we're we're still in production here. It's it's going to be really it's going to be really great. We've got an awesome host. We've got some really exciting uh, contestants that we'll be revealing over the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that for sure. Um, anything else you want to take us home, Satya? No, that is it. Uh, thank you so much, Matteo, for this exciting presentation. We learned a lot, and I'm sure that our audience learned a lot as well. Uh, and thank you for uh, you know uh, participating in this competition. We are very excited about your submission. You know, finally, when it happens, it's uh, it's really all exciting stuff. And thanks, Phil, for organizing this uh, this webinar. And finally, thank you all all the people around the world uh, who come here and encourage us to do this webinar uh, every week. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks everybody. Next thank week's you. guest will be another OpenCV AI contest team. So stay tuned for that. We'll see you next Thursday, 9 a.m. sharp. Yeah, and a final shout out to our sponsors, Intel and Microsoft Azure for making this competition possible. Thanks. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the webinar. Please hit that like button, subscribe, and don't forget to tap the little bell icon to be notified when new episodes drop. This week's episode was brought to you by Intel and Microsoft Azure as part of OpenCV Spatial AI Contest. Follow along with the Oak Delight Contest hashtag. If you'd like to be in the audience next week, subscribe to the OpenCV newsletter.